Hello, and welcome to Dr. Vaughn Science Theater. I love enzymes. Yeah, enzymes make me happy. This section, we're talking about enzymes. We're going to cover an intro to enzymes, kinetics versus thermodynamics, ending with a Michaelis-Mitten approach. In the next section, we're going to go over enzyme inhibition and control, allosteric enzymes, zymogens, active sites focusing on chymotrypsin and ACTase. And then, of course, we're going to talk about coenzymes, cofactors, and prosthetic groups. Enzymes are mostly going to be globular proteins, and they're going to be used in all all reactions in the body. Most of them are very specific. Some of them are fairly specific, meaning that they're going to catalyze the reactions of a very specific substrate. So a definition for an enzyme would be a biological catalyst. There are other catalysts that exist, but these are going to be the globular proteins that are in the body speeding up reactions without themselves being changed. It's just a transient change. There is an exception to the globular protein rule of enzymes enzymes, and that is the ribozymes, which are small RNAs that can catalyze reactions. So we're not going to talk about those in this section. Just know that it's not only globular proteins that can be enzymes. Okay, the universal enzyme classification has named enzymes. So most enzymes are going to be ending in an ASE. If you see that they're not such as like with pepsin, then that is because it was named prior to the universal enzyme classification. But we can classify enzymes and it kind of looks like an IP address. And the first number that you see with the enzyme classification is the type or the six different classes of enzymes. So let's cover those those oxidoreductases these are going to add or remove hydrogens they're going to do redox reactions transferase exactly what it sounds like they're going to transfer functional groups between a donor and acceptor molecule an example would be our kinases that regulate metabolism they tr transfer phosphate from ATP they're going to break the bonds they're going to transfer phosphate. A high energy bond in ATP is broken and they take the phosphate and put it on another molecule. So they're going to be transferring the functional groups. A hydrolase. This is going to add water across a double bond and do what it's saying. Hydrolyze it. When you add water, you're going to be breaking a bond. Lyase. This is going to add different compounds, ammonia, water, maybe even carbon dioxide across a double bond to remove the double bond or to produce it. Lyases can also produce double bonds. So when you think lyase, think double bond. Bonds. Isomerase, exactly what it sounds like. It's going to make an isomer. It is going to shift chemical groups about an asymmetric carbon. Ligases, two chemical groups are going to be joined or ligated. Ligation means it's going to link together with the use of ATP. So when we're going to join or synthesize molecules from smaller parts, it's always going to take energy. The enzymes are going to be very specific with their temperature and pH range at which they are optimal. If you look at a graph of their activity versus temperature, you'll see that it is rising with temperature as you would expect from heating up a chemical reaction. It is still true that if you heat up an enzyme, which is a chemical, that it will speed up the reaction and it's gonna reach a peak at which it, we're gonna call that its optimal temperature. At this optimal temperature is what the enzyme is going to be most efficient at and typically that's going to be body temperature for humans at 37 degrees Celsius. Then you see as you heat it up beyond that, say if you have a really, really Really, really high fever, then you're going to start denaturing your proteins and they're going to become less effective until ultimately they stop working. So the temp optimal temperature for say a human versus a bacteria that loves to be in arctic ice, obviously you're going to have enzymes that are optimal for the temperature that your body or your cell is at. So it depends on the organism, on the temperature that their enzymes will be optimal. Another factor that can affect enzyme function and that is pH. As you know, an enzyme is a globular protein which has a lot of amino acid residues. And we talked about in the first section that there are pKa values at which an amino acid residue is, their R group is going to be protonated or deprotonated, which is gonna change the function in the protein. So as our bodies have a different pH depending on where you're at. Stomach has a pH of about 2. The rest of the body is like 7.4. Saliva, would, and so the mouth would be about 7. The duodenum is going to be loaded with a bicarbonate solution from the pancreas to neutralize the chyme, the acidic chyme from the stomach. So it's going to be slightly above the 
the physiological pH. So you'd expect any enzymes working in the duodenum to be optimal at, I don't know, I'm guessing, say eight or around that. So it's gonna be slightly higher because they're acting in the duodenum. So looking at the graphs for pH, the relative activity versus a pH. You can see that the stomach is going to have an optimal enzyme, say pepsin. The stomach enzyme pepsin is going to be optimal at two, exactly what you would expect for an enzyme in the stomach. Okay, trypsin is a duodenal enzyme, and it's going to be produced in the pancreas in an inactive zymogen form. And that's just to prevent it from acting on the proteins because it's a protease. A protease is going to be breaking peptide bonds of proteins, and you don't want it acting on its own maker. So the pancreas is going to create this inactive zymogen. We'll go over zymogens in the next lesson. And we're going to call that trypsinogen. It's going to be transferred via the pancreatic duct to the duodenum for digestion in the small intestine. And then we have another enzyme, enteropeptidase, which is going to activate it. It's going to undergo proteolytic cleavage. Because it's in the duodenum where it's actually active, it's going to be at a slightly higher pH than physiological pH. It's going to be in between 7.5 to 8.5. So let's call it 8. So the activity of trypsin is going to be optimal at a pH of 8. There's going to be two main types of enzymes. We have simple enzymes and complex enzymes. The simple enzyme, the example would be ribonuclease, is just a globular protein. Then we have complexes. It's going to be the simple enzyme plus a relatively small organic molecule. We're going to call that a holoenzyme whereas the simple enzyme is an apoenzyme. So the complex is going to be an apoenzyme plus a small organic molecule. Again, we call that a holoenzyme. So the small organic molecule can be two different things. If it's covalently bound, which means it's basically a permanent bond, we're going to call that a prosthetic group. If it is not covalently bound, but it's a small organic molecule, we're going to call it a coenzyme. A lot of vitamins are going to be coenzymes. We also have cofactors, which are going to be non-organic molecules that are helping. An example of a cofactor would be a heme molecule, like you saw in the molecule hemoglobin, although hemoglobin is not an enzyme. An example of a coenzyme would be thiamine, which is vitamin B1. Again, vitamins, their function, the vitamin's function is primarily going to be to assist enzymes fu in functioning. Let's just look at a generic enzyme, and we will focus on the active site in the next section. An enzyme is a globular protein, but not all of it is going to be acting to catalyze reactions. You're going to have a section or an indention of the globular protein that is going to have very specific amino acid residues. These amino acid residues are likely going to have one of the following. They're going to have a charge. They're going to be positive or negative. Think aspartic acid or lysine. They're going to have a pKa value that is going to be close to the active pH. They're going to possibly be hydrophobic. We're going to have some hydrophobic interactions between the enzyme and the substrate, possibly. They're going to have to be flexible because when they're bonding to a substrate, they're going to have to basically get out of the way or move, be able to be flexible to allow for the bonding. And of course, they need to be reactive. Sometimes the active site, we're going to have one of those coenzymes or cofactors here. Again, we'll go over the active site in detail in the next lesson, focusing on chymotrypsin. The rate of reaction, which would be the kinetics, and the thermodynamics, or the thermodynamic favorability. These are actually two different things, but they're closely related when we're talking about a chemical reaction especially an enzyme-catalyzed chemical reaction. So the delta G, the standard free energy change, is the difference in energy from the reactants, which is the initial, and the products, which is the final. So the Gibbs free energy change has nothing to do with the enzyme. Freshman chemistry review, the delta G is a thermodynamic quantity, whereas what we'll talk about in a minute, the activation energy, which is the energy required for an activation to proceed, that is called the activation energy. That is a kinetic quantity. When we look at a free energy diagram, we're going to have the reactants on the left, this big hump that at the peak of it, we're going to call that the transition state. And then we have the products at the lower end on the right. If we were to take the final free energy minus the initial free energy, if we get a negative value, then we would expect that reaction to occur spontaneously. Spontaneously, however, does not mean instantaneously. So it doesn't 
That does not mean that it's going to occur fast. It just means that it can proceed in that direction without having to input energy into the system. But this hump on this diagram that you see, there's an activation energy, which is a barrier that must be overcome to get from the reactants to the products. So we have the delta G, which is the free energy change. Okay, the delta G, again, we know the change in the standard Gibbs free energy is going to tell us the direction of the reaction. So that's what that delta G is going to tell us. If it's negative, it's going to proceed forward. If it's positive, it goes backwards, and we're going to have to input energy into the system. If it's at zero, then the system is in equilibrium. And again, equilibrium definitely does not mean that there's equal concentrations of the reactants to products. It just means that it, the quantities of such do not change over time. If we just have delta G, that is going to be a thermodynamic only value. It doesn't provide any info on the rate or the process of the reaction. So the activation energy, this big hump on the energy diagram, we're going to call that E sub A, and we're going to represent that with a delta G with a double dagger symbol, and that is basically a kinetic value. It's related to the kinetics of a system. The delta G double dagger of, say, an uncatalyzed reaction might be 100 kilojoules. That same reaction, if you catalyze it, the delta G dagger can be, say, 50 kilojoules, which would be the energy for activation being decreased. In this case, the energy for activation was decreased by 50 kilojoules. So, I mean, it depends upon the reaction, how much the enzyme, and it depends upon the enzyme, how much that it actually will lower the activation energy. But that's how an enzyme speeds up the reaction is by lowering that activation energy. If you think of this active energy as you pushing a bowling ball, not very far, you don't have to put that much energy into it, but you know that the bowling ball would go from one level higher to a lower level, and you wouldn't have to input anything. It would just gravity would take it so you know that the reactants have more energy than the product say that there's a little hump of a hill that you need to push it over before it can start rolling down the hill this little hump that you'd have to push the bowling ball over is the activation energy so it's a slight input of energy into the system that allows it to proceed okay so enzymes are going to accelerate or speed up the reaction by lowering the free energy of activation or the delta g double dagger by binding the transition state the transition state is that high point of the energy diagram. So they're going to bind it into an ES complex and allow the reaction to proceed. It's very important to realize that enzymes do not, however, change the delta G that gives free energy for any reaction. It's only going to lower this activation energy and make it more likely for, say, two molecules to hit each other and turn into products. So enzymes will speed up reactions. The rate is denoted with a small k, whereas if you remember, equilibrium is with a capital K. Don't get that confused. I wish they would have picked another letter because K's are kind of difficult. So in summary, the activation energy of an uncatalyzed reaction requires more energy to get started. It's going to be going at a slower rate. It might have a negative delta G free energy value and it might be spontaneous in the thermodynamic sense. But that does not mean that it's fast or instantaneous. Again, the activation energy is like pushing the bowling ball to the top of a hill so it, so it can roll down the hill, which you don't have to input any more energy into that. The transition state is going to be where the ES complex, we'll talk about in a minute, the ES complex, the enzyme substrate complex is going to be at this high point of the energy diagram, and it's going to have the necessary amount of energy and the arrangement of the substrate to produce the products. So then we're going to start rolling down the hill like the bowling ball. Enzyme kinetics is a study of biochemical reaction rate that are catalyzed by an enzyme. Let's look at the equation of what's happening overall. We have E plus S yields ES with a backwards reaction. So we have an equilibrium there. This is the pre-equilibrium step. So we're going to have a forward rate and a backward rate, which we'll get to in a second. Then we go from ES, which is a complex, yields the free enzyme that is unchanged plus a product. So this is the overall reaction of what's occurring with a catalyzed reaction. So we have the enzyme plus a substrate is going to yield the ES complex, which is at equilibrium. And the ES complex is going to yield a free enzyme plus a product, which is different from the substrate. There are three rates of reaction occurring. We have one that we're going to assign K1 to. Remember, it's a small K. It's not a capital K. Capital K is equilibrium. And small K is a rate. So E plus S 
to ES is a K1. ES to E plus S, the backwards reaction, is a K minus 1. Then we have our rate limiting step, which is the slowest of the three, going from the ES complex to the product plus the free enzyme. That is K2. I'll talk more about why it's a rate limiting step and what that means for us later. Let's look at a schematic of what's going on. The substrate is going to bind in the active side of the enzyme, like a locking key, or more like um, an induced fit that we'll talk about, but whatever. It's specific. The geometry of the enzyme's active side is going to be specific for the structure of the substrate, so it's going to bind together. Then we have it stuck together or bound together, that is the ES complex. This is, remember, the high point of the transition state. Then this can go backwards. It can let go of the substrate before it catalyzes the reaction. And then we have, from the ES complex, we're releasing this product that looks different than the original substrate, and the enzyme looks the same. Now we might want to know the rate at which the products are formed, and we're going to need to define a velocity for a reaction. There's various amounts of expressions that you can create where you're ultimately going to derive what we're going to get to is the michaelis minton equation. So I'm not going to really focus on the derivation of getting the equation that we're ultimately going to use. So let's just go over some terms. We're going to have a maximum velocity. We're going to call that the Vmax. This is a maximum velocity the enzyme can attain. It's going to be our highest reaction rate, which can be attained. All enzymes at this point are going to be saturated with substrate. What saturated means is, say you're trying to get into an auditorium, and all the turnstiles have lines of people behind them. And so we don't have any more turnstiles, so we can't get the people into the auditorium any faster. So we would say the turnstiles are saturated. So we have substrates or people waiting so we can't go any faster. So that is at what point that all of the enzymes are taken with a substrate. The Vmax is going to be K2 times the total amount of enzymes, or E sub T. Again, you can derive this algebraically. Another constant that we need to define is the Michaelis constant. We're going to call that a K sub M, and that's going to be equal to, all we're going to do is manipulate the reaction rates, K minus 1 plus K2 divided by K1. We're going to use this Michaelis constant in our derivation of the michaelis minton equation. So looking at the michaelis minton equation, michaelis minton kinetics is going to be one of the best known models for non-allosteric enzymes. And we will continue the next lesson with the michaelis minton model. See you next time. This is Brenda the Not-So-Good Witch signing off for today. See you next time on Dr. Bond Science Theater.